Today is chapter one, section two, human attempts to control nature. I'm going to move down into the input modeling part of the lesson. A nice book to throw into an anticipatory set here is Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel, The Fates of Human Societies. There's a page 13. It's kind of uh, the opening paragraph there that really relates very well to the information here about hunting and gathering and nomadic lifestyle. Okay, let's begin. Roman numeral one says early advances in technology and art. Most people that lived during this time were nomads. They were nomadic. They were highly mobile people. They moved from place to place looking for new sources of food and water. Now, when we talk about the old stone age or the Paleolithic times, most of the people there were nomadic. When you think nomadic, you're generally thinking also hunters and gatherers. Hunter gatherers are nomadic groups whose food supply obviously depends on hunting animals and collecting plants. One thing I like to tell my students is you have to understand that there were gender roles here. There were males and there were females. The men generally did the hunting, the female generally the females generally did the gathering. If you were to ask me which job was more important, I would say 100% the female gender role and work was way more important because they were able to gather way more food than you were able to hunt. You might go out on a hunt and it might take a month and you come back with just a, a, a few, uh, a few you know, pieces of meat. However, the gathering is what keeps the tribe alive on a daily basis. So I think women were really very important to the early survival of these hunter-gatherer groups. Capital letter C, we'll talk about the invention of tools. Things like spears and even digging sticks helped increase the food supply. Digging sticks are basically, it's two flat sticks that you would stick into the ground. If a deep-rooted plant you needed to pry up, if you wanted to have an edible root, you'd have to pry the root up with the digging sticks. Those are some of the earliest tools that were used for helping to develop the food supply. Most tools are made out of stone, wood, or animal bone. Some examples I would say in class, hey, what do you think are some examples of some of these early tools? You might get some answers like knives, fish hooks, harpoons, bone needles for sewing. You could also take it a step further and say, hey guys, what do you think a fish hook would have been made out of back then? You know, you're looking at small animal rib bones, things of that nature. Capital letter D talks about art. We do have a lot of evidence of cave paintings. Um, so art was made out of charcoal, mud, and animal blood. Some of the early drawings were found on the walls of caves, of course, and we generally find three basic colors, including yellow, black, and red. Other forms of art outside of the cave paintings include seashell necklaces, uh, lion teeth necklaces, bear claw necklaces, uh, animal sculptures out of wood or stone, and then, of course, uh, once again, the cave painting. Your textbook has some great examples of cave painting. I'll, I'll flip up to them. Here are some examples that we found here. This is a really popular one with the, with the human hands. We see here we have an example of, you know, maybe the start of domesticating of animals, maybe a little bit of hunting here going on and being depicted there. And then you have, oh, this is a Lascaux cave painting. This is a replica of that cave painting, which was in, in France. I'll scroll back down here for the next part, leave it on this map and come back to the lesson. Okay, Roman numeral number two, we're gonna get into the beginnings of agriculture. We'll talk about how these groups were organized. These early humans lived in bands or tribes, you could call it of 25 to 70 to 75 people. Like I said, men did the hunting and women did the gathering of fruits, berries, roots, and edible grasses. Definitely more food came from gathering than from hunting. Roman numeral three refers to the Neolithic revolution. This is a very important happening uh, right around 8,000 BC. The Neolithic revolution is an agricultural revolution in which it caused far reaching changes in human life because of the development of farming. The change from food gathering to food producing as a cultural practice represents one of the greatest breakthroughs in history. What we need to look at here in history class is what, what may have caused the Neolithic Revolution. Here are some insights to what may have caused that. Number one, we saw a change in climate. Temperature worldwide provided uh, 
and increased temperature worldwide provided longer growing seasons and drier land for cultivating your wild grasses. Uh, point number two, a rich supply of grain would help support a small population boom worldwide. Farming provided a more steady source of food so people could survive a little bit easier. You didn't have as many people dying of, of hunger or moving from place to place. Now here would be a good spot to question your class. What other changes may have occurred because of the invention of farming and agricultural food production? You might wanna see some answers like sedentary lifestyle, which means these groups started to settle in one place because now they didn't have to be nomadic and move from place to place chasing the wild animals or finding undepleted sources of food for gathering. You then started to stockpile food. You created a surplus of food. When you have a surplus of food, then you can really develop civilization. When you have more food than you need, you can then branch out into other things like advanced technology, specialized work where you have some people that are farmers, some people that might still be hunters, some people that become blacksmiths, some people that become teachers, so on and so forth, um, as we progress, of course. And then we had a, a change in diet. You, you started to have a better diet, more readily available food, so things started to change because of farming. Now, one of the earliest farming methods that was utilized is slash and burn farming. Slash and burn farming is basically the cutting of trees or grasses to clear a field and then burn those trees and grasses, the remains of what you cut down right over top of the field. The ashes from that burned, uh, from those burned plants and grasses would actually fertilize the soil. There's some nutrient value remaining there. This process was done in two year cycles. So you'd slash, you'd burn, you'd let that, that field lie fallow. And then the following year after, you know, that first year and then the second year of lying fallow, you would then plant on that field. So we're talking about the domestication of plants, but you also had the domestication of animals, or in other words, taming of animals. Domestication means taming and control over animals and breeding of animals for reproductive purposes. Early animals to be domesticated include species like the horse, dog, goat, and pig. Nomads also would tame animals such as sheep, goat, and camel. They generally started to herd their animals to new pastures and water sources. This is where you have your shepherds and things of that nature coming into play. One of the things I tell my students is that not all animal species can be domesticated. When you go to a circus, you know, you're seeing bear, you're seeing elephant. Uh, those are kind of special circumstances in my mind. Not all wild animals have the propensity to be a domesticable species for the use of human purposes. Okay, Roman numeral five is gonna talk about the development of farming in many places. And the textbook has a map about this on page 17. In Africa, near the Nile River Valley, we saw an important agricultural center for the growth of wheat, barley, and other crops. In China, about 8,000 years ago, the Neolithic Revolution, 8,000 years ago, farmers along the middle stretches of the Yellow River cultivated a grain called millet. And about 1,000 years later, farmers first domesticated wild rice in the Chongyang River Delta. In Mexico and Central America, farmers were cultivating corn, beans, and squash. This was the general diet for almost all Native American societies. These were their staple crops. In Peru, farmers in the Andes Mountains were the first known groups to grow tomatoes and sweet potatoes and also white potatoes. Now, I'm going to refer you to the map. So this map right here kind of shows you some of those culture hearths, some of those early river valleys, and then it kind of tells you what major crops were grown and when. The colors kind of tell you the time periods of when these things were grown. And there's some symbols on here that kind of talk about, okay, was barley grown here, uh, was wheat. But this is kind of the culture hearth right here. This is the oldest. It says agriculture by 5000 BC. This is Egypt and then Mesopotamia, the land between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. These are the fertile floodplains where some of your earliest agriculture began. You also had some early agriculture in the Indus River Valley here in Indi modern day India, Northern India, and you also have the rivers of China. So your early culture hearths, your early river-based civilizations are Egypt, Sumer, not in the proper order. Actually, Sumer would be first followed closely by Egypt, Indus River and China all coming in uh, roughly around the same time. 
that is the end of the lesson. Uh, to check for understanding what I would have students do is take just a few minutes at the end of class to basically hypothesize some of the disadvantages that may exist by settling and going transferring from nomadic hunter-gatherer lifestyle to sedentary or settled village slash city living. And so we would come up with some brainstorming ideas to talk about, hey, what are some of the disadvantages? What could possibly happen that could go wrong if you are living in a sedentary lifestyle?